This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This episode is sponsored by the London College of Garden Design, Melbourne. Based at the Royal Botanic Gardens, Melbourne, the college brings together unique Australian design and horticultural expertise with the training experience of Europe's leading garden design college. The college delivers professional skills training for those aiming for a career in landscape design and from 2021 will offer a real-time online option for those who want to study from anywhere in Australia or New Zealand. To find out more, visit lcgd.com.au. This week, I'm speaking to Harriet Gross, Emeritus Professor of Psychology at the University of Lincoln. She was part of a team that won a gold medal for the Digital Capabilities Garden at the 2013 Chelsea Flower Show, and she's the author of The Psychology of Gardening. I talked to Harriet about our emotional connection to our gardens, what makes us connected to nature and the environment, why we can be territorial over our gardens, and just what it is we get from gardening. I started by asking Harriet about why she wrote her book. The reason I um, became interested in gardening, in a sense, is because it was a family interest. So my background as a psychologist wasn't necessarily in the psychology of gardening. It was in children's development. Uh, But over time, uh, I became more and more interested in gardening. And academics like me are very, very lucky to be able to research things that they find interesting. And I was actually prompted by a very strange experience where I had to go on television to say why the gardeners at the Chelsea Flower Show uh, presenting uh, liked particular flowers or guess which flower went with each of them. And that prompted my interest to say, oh, so is that the case? Do people have uh, different preferences for flowers because of their personality or because of psychology? So that kind of piqued my interest. And then I started talking to people about gardening. Um, and as someone who personally had a garden but hadn't really done very much dramatic about it, I thought, oh, well, I'll just talk to other people about it. And as I did that, and as a psychologist who'd been interested in how, in how children develop and develop their interests, uh, I found it really fascinating that so much of gardening covered lots of bits of psychology. And that really kind of drew my attention because psychology sometimes felt so it was a bit remote from people's daily living rather than being about the processes that underpin that living. So gardening was a really good way to kind of talk to people about what things were important to them. And the reason I wrote the book was because once I discovered this, I thought, oh, I think other people need to know about it. And I think there's a lot that people haven't really thought about in psychology with respect to how important these activities are. And that was a little while ago before we are where we are now, where lots and lots of people are talking about the benefits and the well-being that follows from activities of being in nature. So it was a kind of mission, but time intervened. And in fact, um, I did a garden at Chelsea uh, with some colleagues before I even got round to writing the book. So um, it came at a later point. But I think there's a lot of psychology that hasn't taken account of people's own experiences in these ways that needed to be just highlighted. So that was my reason for doing the book, really. Mm. I have to ask you, did you get the flowers right? <laughs> uh, I did just about get them right. Yes, I had to stand in a makeshift studio in a tent in Ch- at Chelsea and say which flower had belonged to which uh, presenter and then they had to say why uh, they liked it. Uh, I did just about get it right, but it was a bit of a, it was a completely random thing that I was asked to do as a psychologist. <laughs> and that's psychologists get asked that. And thri- strictly speaking, professionally, if it's not an area of your expertise, you shouldn't really do that kind of thing. But it just seemed like a fairly lighthearted moment, but it did prompt a change in my activity. So it was quite good from that perspective. Yeah, fair. Um, and it is interesting what you said, but obviously more, I think probably more people are gardening now more than ever. Um, and I did wonder reading the book whether the amount of research that's been conducted into the psychology of gardening is actually commensurate with its popularity in this country. Do you think that it is? Uh, I suppose it's an answer of yes and no, um, in as much as I think the, the, the very popularity of something like gardening made it seem like probably something that was a, a sort of hobby activity 
And yes, people would recognize like any skill that you might learn, like playing a musical instrument or learning chess. It takes uh, a dimension of clear intellectual effort, mental effort and so on. But I think perhaps people had to some extent uh, underplayed the importance of the emotional side and the benefits for mental health and well-being. Although there has been packet, pockets of um, research going on, it's often been about people's relationship with nature more generally rather than gardening per se. And I think the focus typically has been on the environment and on uh, nature as a general thing and the fact features of nature that make a difference to people um, rather than uh, the, the therapeutic value. But there has been an enormous history in this country, obviously, of therapeutic horticulture through prisons, through mental health institutions and so on. So it isn't that it, people aren't aware of the importance of gardening. I think it's that psychology researchers uh, tended to focus more on the underlying processes uh, and uh, skills uh, experience rather than on the emotional side of it. Mm, yeah, it's interesting what you said there about the studies more being into nature and, and the environment. Um, and you did actually mention that in the book. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about if there's a connection between people who are connected to, to nature and concerned with the environment and their personality type. Is there a, is there a link? Well, I think that it's a very interesting concept and something that's emerged over the period of people doing research uh, in psychology. So that's within environmental psychology in particular and some key researchers who have talked about the importance of the environment. And it has been environmental psychology in a sense started um, before the first, the second world war and, and came to a fore kind of during the fifties and sixties. It started off through Kurt Levine's work, but, um, people began to see the importance of nature perhaps more than just an environment as a context for activity. Um, and people started talking about the concept of environmental identity, um, or connectedness to nature, whereby if people believe they're part of nature, they also will be interested in or seek out um, information or find out about things that would help them be more engaged with nature. So the way we find out about whether people are connected um, to nature um, is standard kind of psychology approach uh, in one sense, which is to ask people to rate themselves on a questionnaire, which asks them how they feel about nature. So, you know, am I somebody who thinks of myself as part of nature or do I feel more separate from it? Uh, do I spend a lot of time in natural settings and so on? And it, it's been a proposed as a result of those kinds of the outcome of those kinds of surveys that the kind of idea of nature relatedness is part of your innate character. So that it's, a, it's known as a psychological trait. And the case is that people who have higher levels of it nature relatedness tend to have a stronger affinity with animals with nature they belong to environmental organizations and so on um, but and it includes being keen on other things in nature that sometimes people really don't like about nature like spiders or snakes and things so it, it is a broad sense of what nature is and this is also something that people have found an association and in psychology an association means that they're it's linked, but it isn't a cause of. So it may be that it's a, another dimension of some other aspects of people's personality, like they're more open to experience or they're more extroverted and so on. And everybody has some of those. Uh, it depends the balance of which is more in your personality and versus somebody else's uh, just varies by the amount, if you like. Um, but as you say, um, people who tend to rate themselves more highly on nature connectedness or nature relatedness are generally more concerned about the environment uh, and they also rate themselves as being more likely to carry out actions that would protect the environment. So from gardening perspective, then it might be that the garden itself would reflect someone's personality in relation to how nature related they are. So they might be very keen on doing organic gardening, they might be more keen on recycling, they might get a very fancy compost bin, speaking personally, I've got a very fancy hot compost bin, um, or they might be, it might be important for them to grow their own food so they know where it comes from and sources are, you know, protected from pollution and so on. So yes, at one level, 
the garden and the way people garden might reflect their personality as measured by their kind of nature connectedness. Um, and people always say, don't they, about other people's gardens, oh, it's just like you, or I would expect it to look like this. And they're sometimes surprised if people's gardens don't look like how they imagine the person to be from their house, for example. So it might be the garden's very different from the house. Um, an example might be that you have a very tidy house, but quite a kind of overgrown and wild garden, deliberately, not just because you couldn't be able to do anything about it. Um, uh, but also the, the person's style of gardening uh, might be connected to other aspects of their personality, like something that's been called the perceived need for structure, which isn't related to the environment. So there are other parts of personality that may much may determine how a garden is um, that isn't just to do with uh, connectedness to nature. So it might be that people are more concerned about having control over things. So they want a garden to be tidy or they want it to be uh, well managed and allow space for social interaction and so on. So their own individual preferences uh, are important with respect to that. I think in the book I talk about um, somebody talking about their mum's buddleia and mum's rockery. Uh, and dad's garden having annual bedding plants and so on. So differences in the way we garden may, may reflect other things about us, not just um, our nature connectedness and the environment. Mm. It's really interesting. There could I was thinking about what you said about a tidy house and then a slightly freer style garden, um, which I would say kind of sums up my environment. But <laughs> it is a conflict, I have to say, because I like to have kind of tidiness and sometimes looking out at a garden where you know you you really should leave it alone but it's like having an itch you can't scratch because there's part of you that's going yeah I know but I'm looking at this and I really want to go out there and I really want to tidy it up and I know if I tidy it up it'll make me feel a lot better but where does that instinct come from is it that the control thing the, the kind of desire for control and order over your surroundings yeah I mean I think a number I think it's it's a number of things because um it's it's not a need for control in terms of absolute tidiness. It's about being able to make decisions and being able to be decisive in the context in which you find yourself. So the thing that, um, if you like, causes you that conflict is because your normal preference is to be a person who likes to be decisive. And that's demonstrated in the fact that you've decided you want this room or this area to be tidy. And the conflict is, feeling that you can't have time or the energy to do the everywhere, but also that you're also, unlike house, where although living with a family or with partners and so on, your house gets messy because they move things, outside in the garden, your relationship with nature is different. So you might start off with it tidy and then things grow. Like the last summer, everything grew enormously over the summer. And so suddenly your garden, which looked quite neat and tidy, has suddenly gone, hang on a second, this won't do. But at the same time, because you believe that nature is an important part of this relationship, you don't want to just go out there if you've got a kind of high sense of nature connectedness and go, right, I'm just going to chop everything down again. Because you're going, well, this is how it's done really well this year, so I need to give it credit kind of thing. So I think there's a kind of mix between the different aspects of oneself. And it happens in all areas of life. If you were to talk about being environmentally aware, you know, it'd be very interesting when we see how many people have taken up gardening in this period since the pandemic. And I know we might talk about that later. Um, is that will those people continue to be focused on the environment in the way that they have been? They're all wanting to fly away to foreign countries and have a holiday, but actually environmentally flying is a terrible thing. So people's behavior is not consistent. And I suppose that's the point I'm making that, that consistency depends on circumstances and also other aspects of your relationship so your connectedness to nature may overcome your need for control for example mm. yeah I think also gardens and homes are uh, to a degree a reflection of your personality or, or your self-identity so if you have a messy garden I think and this is an issue for a lot of people who, who like wildlife gardening they feel that you know people might be judging them by their the, you know the state of their garden and, and if they don't understand why it's looking a particular way then that could be seen as a slight on on them um but that's kind of connected to the fact that people will become emotionally attached to their gardens as well i suppose because in the book you cited an example i, I think sort of spoke about it generally where people sometimes don't move house because they're so attached to the garden um you know where does that come from 
Well, I, th I think it's really interesting. And that's something that I found really interesting when we were doing some research, particularly across the lifespan. So part of looking at well, how gardens are important for people is that obviously they're important for different reasons at different times uh, in people's lives. So obviously, if you have children uh, at home, probably your garden which may be very important, but it may be very much more meaningful and important for you to be able to have your children be able to go outside and be in the garden because that's important to you. When you're a teenager, you just want to have somewhere to sit, you know, to kind of meet your friends or get out of the way of your parents or whatever. And as you get older, you may have more time or you may have more money or you may have a bigger garden. And so gardening in itself becomes more interesting. But the emotional attachment, I think, is related to all of those things. So when we talk to people or ask them about their garden, they, they're, they're very quick, whether they're young, old, men, women, uh, you know, people who garden pe a lot, people who don't, is to mention things that are important to them about it, which is to do with um, their personal history, things that have, there is, they associate positively in the garden, um, people who've been with them in the garden or who have contributed to it. So that's part of it. And a lot of that is about family. A lot of it is often about past memories of childhood or of families. Uh, so doing things with your mom or for your dad or granddad. Um, and so you're linking to the past and present. And I think also you plant things in memory of people. So people who are fortunate enough to be in the same house for a long period of time, for example, with a garden have planted things that have come up that they put in their idea was to have that and it's become something you know beautiful so leaving it behind is like oh uh, but that's that you know i put that there that's really really important um so it's partly creativity and that sense of ownership and this is this is my god and this is how i created it this is part of me it's also a sense of achievement because this is you know i did i did this um but it's also those personal links, the, the memories of your daughter that you might have planted a tree or even just a rose bush and things like that. And it's meaningful to people from that perspective. But it's also so those really important individual identity aspects. But also it's about, as I just mentioned, a relationship with nature. And that relationship is what's in the garden. So when you go out there, from your kitchen or wherever and you see what's happening next and you feel or you see the seeds coming up, you're thinking, oh, great, I know what's going to be happening. So you've got a future attached to the garden. So you're always thinking ahead in the garden because you're going, oh, well, I'm going to plant this and so I'll see this. So leaving a garden, at what point do you say, I'm going to leave it? Would it be better to move in the winter, for example, so that you can't, you know, you don't have, you don't miss something in the summer so I think it's a constant sort of pushing forward because you're always working with the cycle of nature and nature's time and that's much longer than typically you know it's both quicker if you like than mo most people move house um, and you're focusing on small things and also the way that nature draws you in although it, ha it will happen wherever you are it it doesn't seem like that because of all the other things, the social things, the opportunities for having a bit of a break from the pressures of being in the house or being at work, a refuge somewhere away from the house uh, that isn't quite the same as the house. So as you say, your garden is perhaps not as tidy as you might wish it was, but actually it's kind of restful to go out there. Um, and in fact, we know that the kind of visual scene in the garden and in nature is part of what gives it its restorative quality that the, 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 the being away from your usual circumstances, being um, able to see particular kind of visual um, scenes with grass and trees and so on reduces our stress levels. So when we go in the garden, that's how we feel. And obviously, if you associate that kind of experience with being in the garden, then it's harder and harder to leave it. So it is like a being in your home and leaving your home. It's, it's not just an addition to a home. You know, it's not just an extra room that you've got. It is, it, it's a reflection of all those aspects of your own personality and identity, and identity more than personality. Because it may be where you don't have to be a mum or a dad. You're a gardener when you're out there. You know, it's a different kind of life, but also it's somewhere to give that gives you a space to switch off. And I'm sure all gardeners know that sense that once you're in the garden, uh, you're in the garden and it could be hours before you realise that you've spent hours in the garden.
or your family may notice that, that you haven't made them any lunch um, or that you haven't made that phone call or whatever because you just said you were popping out for five minutes and the next thing you know, it's two or three hours later, even though you can't say what you've achieved in that time. And that sense of freedom is a bit like a form of mindfulness. It's often called flow, um, where you become so absorbed in doing something that you really don't notice the passage of time. And that's a very freeing experience and also allows you mentally to relax because you're not, you know, worrying about things that are happening or you are able to stop being worried about them. Mm. Yeah, again, I think I it's for me personally, it's a conflict because I like the restfulness of looking out at a particularly well ordered garden, um, yeah. you know, and where there's a structure and a sort of pattern. I like all of that, that that speaks to my, you know, my brain. But I also like to be able to go out in my garden and, uh, you know, kind of lose myself um in what i think is termed as soft fascination so in a garden where it's maybe more messy you've got more wildlife you've got more close-up detail so yeah i think i think it's some and some probably you have to you know and that's the uh, the art of gardening and finding a garden that works for you it's it's striking that balance between the kind of bigger picture and the smaller detail maybe um but also, so the fact that we sort of imbue our gardens with meaning that's personal to us, is that another reason why we get so territorial over them? Because I'm thinking of those programmes probably that are on Channel 5 where, uh, you know, you see terrible neighbours having the worst disputes and it generally comes over sort of boundaries and gardens and people get unbelievably angry about anything to do with gardens and maybe cutting back shrubs and pe- neighbours' hedges. It's such a, a point of tension. Like, is that you know, is that to do with the fact that these things are kind of the embodiment of us or an extension of us? Well, I, supp- I suppose, yes, to some degree. I mean, I think there's some very interesting work about boundaries and neighbourhood boundary disputes and how those are managed. And I think it, it, we are very territorial, particularly in the way that because lots of, for lots of us, our boundaries are very clearly demarcated by fences and things like that with houses or there are, bal- you know, the width of our balcony or... Um, it, you know, we, we're very, we are very clear about which is our bit and which is somebody else's bit of garden and so on. And I think it is often, um, driven by what makes it important within our own garden. So if within your garden, you're concerned about having more of a wildlife garden, then if you see people chopping down trees and removing, um, uh, hedging in order to put in a fancy new fence, um, you may think, well, they're not adhering to the principle of what gardening and nature is about. It's not just about having a nice room in the garden. It's about having nature. And, you know, you're making nature not, you know, you, the view is that you're changing it. But also it is, I mean, I think it's a more fundamental human instinct to be, to protect one's own, um, one's own, in, one's own boundaries and environments. Particularly if you, you know, if you get on well with your neighbours, then, that's absolutely fine. But if you don't necessarily have a good relationship with your neighbours, then an outside boundary dispute probably reflects a larger kind of lack of contact or communication with them. Um, you know, even I, I'm sure that, you know, my neighbour, for example, I think probably thinks I'm a bit uh, un, unhelpful because I've asked to treat, trim her trees because they make they overshadow my garden such and all my plants lean out one way um it doesn't affect her because they are on the other side of the fence um but you know we try to have a reasonable relationship over this and we you know we only do it occasionally um so i do understand that sense of that kind of boundary you know my this is my boundary and i've decided what's in my garden but if it's not going to grow here because of what you're doing or if you're going to put cement along the, the edge then my roots of my plants won't do as well so i think it is about that kind of identity and and investment and commitment to our gardens. Although I think it'd be fair to say that in many cases there are some kind of standards that annoy, like you know conifers causing getting six foot, you know starting at six foot and then being twenty foot high. So it's kind of reasonable. Uh, yeah, she said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's understandable. I get that. <laughs> yeah, but I suppose what I would say is that for a lot of people, boundary disputes are 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 not about the actual garden it, it's about a kind of feeling of invasion in some other way by noise and things like that so yeah it is it is a real it's a real issue i know that also in the book was interesting because you know you spoke about gardens and and all the things that they embody for us but then i thought well okay 
a lot of people are invested in allotments and they're not necessarily extensions of the home. So, you know, what what's the what's the fascination or what's the reward or the kind of human benefit to having an allotment? I think the benefit from an allotment is all of the above, effectively, and boundary disputes are um, just as much a case in allotment, True. you know, uh, on allotment sites. You know, people going, well, I don't want the weeds from their garden for allotment coming onto my carefully tended, you know, sieved soil. You know, I've, I've clearly done that. So I think all of the above, the you know, so all of that emotional stuff about personal history, links with the past, investment of time and effort, relationship with nature and particularly it's a very kind of particularly if people choose to make to grow vegetables on their allotment the kind of natural cycle is to some extent slightly speedier than some of the um, uh, ornamental kind of processes of kind of development so it might take a while for your rose bush to look more like a bush but if you if you plant carrot seeds they'll look like carrots in the same kind of you know six month period and that's that's quite a short cycle if you like and so the fascination of seeing things coming and then being ready is even more the case on an allotment sometimes than it is uh in the garden uh the home garden so i think it's all of those the other thing is i think that what i've said about um your home garden is that it's a different space than your inside home and of course an allotment typically apart from a very few people who have them at the end of their garden um it's it's a real separation so it's somewhere to go that is personal to you but it is separate from home so it is a real refuge where not only can you go to mull over those things or um kind of experience nature but you can have space from the the things that are around you normally which cause you may cause you anxiety may be causing problems or you're having to deal with or that gives you space to think about work and Lots of people that I've talked to about allotment volunteer quite freely that they consider it to be their sanctuary or their refuge, and they have gardens at home. So it's it's not it's more than um, than what they can have at home because it is separate from home. And the other value to it is that they they have a purpose to go there, which is to produce food or increase their the you know their ability to compete in flower shows or whatever it is that they you know they can't necessarily manage at home because there's family or other commitments and so on in the garden for example the children need to play ball and so you can't keep prized dahlias because they'll just be knocked over all the time so those kinds of freedom and the sense of being able to switch off outside um the the boundary of your home fence um the other thing i think to say about a lot is that they are communal although and they are a community. So even though there are boundaries to each allotment, there's a lot, there's other people there who have the same interests as you. So there is a community of people. So there's an opportunity to make new friends, learn from others, share ideas and so on. So it, it may be, you know, an opportunity to do more being a gardener than it is at home, for example. Mm, in, really interesting. Yeah. I, I can see all of that. Um, and what you said there was, was also interesting about the fact that they are kind of refuges. And one of my questions was, you know, why did we all take refuge in our gardens during the pandemic? Was it just that we had nowhere else to go or was there kind of more behind it psychologically? Um, well, I think, you know, there are those practical, um, reasons i'm sure because people couldn't go out you know in the first lockdown there was just something recently from the office of national statistics which suggested there's another that three million people um spent more time in their gardens um, another three million people about, over and above the 27 or so million people already gardening um during the first lockdown and of course the timing of the initial lockdown was such that it was a great time to be in your garden the weather was generally very good um, you know, you could get outside the house. You were all at home if you're in a family or on your own and you need and working. It was somewhere you could go without having to leave the house. So some very practical thing. Um, and the lack of anywhere else to go because everywhere else was shut. And I think, and also some of the things that I think prompted and people have talked about was at the beginning of the lockdown in particular, there was such a huge change in the level of noise, um, from traffic. Um, and people suddenly notice things more around them more. So we know 
from um, research that, you know, even being able to see nature is beneficial in lots of different ways, whether that's um, seeing pictures of trees while running on a treadmill or whether it's looking out of the window while you're in hospital, uh, all give an increase in mood or improve uh, uh, recovery rates or reduce stress and so on. And being able to notice nature more, even for short periods, certainly calms people down and then you're more able to notice the things that are happening in your garden, even if they are annoying you. So people have said, you know, I've had to make over my whole garden because I realized that it looked terrible or I've really enjoyed digging things that I'd never done before. So also an opportunity to do things that otherwise they don't have time to do, for example, like because they're going out. So it is a kind of balancing of activity. Um, and I think so the refuge aspect was because it was a refuge from being on screen and even being on your screen in a garden or in a, in a, in a park is slightly less stressful than when you're in your house um, doing the same work. So there are real benefits to being outdoors. And it's important, of course, because lots of people don't have gardens. And so public gardens have been as important for people who live in flats or have very crowded living conditions where they need to get away uh, so that they can benefit from that experience too of being outdoors being in touch with nature and allowing that fascination um, and both hard and soft fascination um, to to capture their attention you know that nature can capture your attention when you're trying to find things to do um, you know pe some people have also taken up lots of different hobbies in order to do the same kind of thing to give them an a purpose, but also to give them a um, a sense of, of of relaxation. You know, one of the things when we, if we're talking about particularly about um, people going out into nature, but also going out to visit gardens, and visiting gardens um, has many of the same benefits as doing gardening, although it's not the same because doing gardening gives you a whole set of other things that you get from it, like the productivity, like the sense of engaging directly with your own past and future, etc. Being out in nature is obviously a good thing in many, many ways. And so I'm not saying that's not good, but it's not quite the same as doing gardening. It's being in a garden. But the kind of nature, you know, part of what we've just, what I've just said is that nature captures our attention. And one of the ways it does that um, is with repetitive patterns. And that's what fractals are, basically. They're a kind of never-ending uh, pattern. And whatever the scale of them, they stay the same, whether they get tinier and tinier or larger and larger. The pattern is the same. And they're present in many, many natural uh, things, uh, whether that's um, plants or animals or landscapes, indeed. Um, and so it could be snowflakes, it can be ferns, it can be petal arrangements and so on. And the thing about that aspect of fractal, which sounds really fancy and is a geometric kind of concept, is that they, the kind of rate of, of rep repetition is what is important about how positively they might be received. So if things are too crowded and busy in the kind of pattern, then it doesn't reduce stress particularly. But if they're too un uh, repetitive, so if they're just rather kind of spread out, then like, equally that doesn't work as well. So the point about the kind of recurrence or the repeating is that um, when it happens at different sizes, particularly, and that's something that happens in plants and in some um, other natural things like river deltas and so on, there's less, what there is is less effort in processing that information. And the benefit of that is that one of the things about gardens being restorative and nature being restorative is the idea that it, it requires less mental effort, that, that, that it reduces our stress by reducing the amount of mental effort we have to make to attend to it. And because something repeats, we don't have to keep attending to it because we know what it's like, but it is as well hugely attractive in itself. So a grassy landscape that's got like open views and trees is an ideal kind of landscape view that people like and that's why a lot of gardens look like grass and trees and some shrubs because that is a particularly ideal kind of balance of repetition um, but individually things like flowers and uh, trees and so on 
draw and our, our attention grabbing because of the way that they go from large to small and so on. So it's about um, reducing the stress for people when they're when they're in nature by nature itself having these features that we 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 unconsciously notice. So they're easy to process and they let the brain kind of recover from other things we've been doing which take a lot of attention, especially things like being on computers all day, for example. As if we need any more reasons to get away from our computer screens and out into nature. A very big thank you to Harriet for being such a fantastic guest and for shedding light on the psychology behind why we love gardening. And once again, thank you to the London College of Garden Design Melbourne, who sponsored this episode. Don't forget that from this year, the college will offer a real-time online option for those who want to study from anywhere in Australia or New Zealand. To find out more, visit lcgd.com.au. Thanks to you for listening. Here's Dr Ian Bedford with a phenomenon found in the bug world that is, well, I'll leave it to Ian to explain. Within the animal kingdom, there's a number of species that have evolved ways to generate sound by rubbing together two different parts of their body. And they use these sounds as signals, which are usually unique to each species, to either deter predators, attract mates, or confront rivals. Described as chirping, shrilling, or rasping, we call this noise-making technique stridulation. And whilst there are species of fish, snakes and spiders who stridulate, by far the greatest number are found within the insect world and include species that over millions of years have perfected their stridulation technique, such as the grasshoppers and crickets that we'll have heard chirping their signals to each other from within a grassy meadow. But despite using different body parts and various cuticular structures to create unique sounds, the fundamental method for stridulation is virtually the same for all the different insect species, and involves scraping tiny plectrum-like pegs, usually on a leg or under a wing case, over little bumps or ridges on another part of their body. And depending on the shape and rigidity of these structures, the resultant sound will differ in its frequency, pitch and volume for each species, enabling direct communication with potential mates through the cacophony of sounds that often exist within a wildlife-rich natural habitat. And those grasshopper and cricket species are so well evolved at stridulating their own unique signals that even a well-trained human ear can differentiate them. My story about stridulating insects, though, wouldn't be complete without mentioning the remarkable feat of a water beetle called Micronectar schultzii. Just two millimetres long, living in ponds and streams throughout southern Britain, the males of this tiny little coleopteron are known as the loudest animals on Earth relative to their size, stridulating so intensely that they generate over 99 decibels, equivalent to being next to a full symphonic orchestra. And despite being muted underwater, their sounds are still audible to somebody standing on the bank. So how does this tiny beetle achieve this? Well, just like other stridulators, it rubs two body parts together. One being its abdomen, with its sound-enhancing ridges, whilst the other is an appendage, revealed by the common name for this water beetle, the singing penis. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.